The, the guys who are getting baptized are just going to share their testimony, a little bit about what God's done in their life. So they're going to do that just for a few minutes each. So you're welcome if you need to like move around or if you're getting cold under the shade, you can sit in the sun or do whatever you want. You're welcome to mix and mingle. Or if you want to sit up here, you're welcome to. But um, we're going to have um, Steph and Kate uh, who are going to share first. And then Courtney's going to come and share her testimony and then Amanda at the end. So in that order. But I'm going to invite um, Steph and Kate. are going to come up first and share with us. So, guys, looking forward to hearing your testimonies. <clears throat> Did you see that submission? Thanks, Al. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. I'm super excited to be here this morning, finally being baptised. It's been a long time coming. Today, I publicly declare my love for Christ, and I appreciate each and every one of you for coming to witness this. It's also so special for me to be doing this with my cousin, my sister-in-law, my husband, but most of all, Steph. We could never have predicted that 14 years on, God would bless us with faith, marriage, three healthy children, and the privilege of getting baptized together. Come on here. Come on here. I'm one of seven siblings and grew up in a Christian home. This one right here. With parents who loved the Lord, who faithfully took us to church and prayed with us often. At nine years of age, while at a youth camp in Foxton, I decided I wanted to follow Christ. Here, I began to understand that God is the creator of all things, including you and I, that he was sovereign over everything in my life, whether I liked it or not, that I was a sinner and selfish by nature, and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was sacrificed on the cross and rose again to provide redemption for my sins. So way back then, I knelt beside my camp leader and prayed to God, asking him to forgive me and to love me. Looking back at my life since then and the choices I subsequently made, I cannot be completely certain that that was the moment that I was truly saved. I know that my understanding and knowledge of God's word as a nine-year-old was weak at best and my willingness to be obedient proved fragile. But I also know that since that day, God was calling me. He made me aware of my sin and continually convicted me to fight against it. At the end of the day though, it doesn't really matter when it happened. As I can say with absolute certainty, right here and now, that while I am still not perfect, I love Jesus Christ and my desire is to glorify and live in obedience to him. Going back though, sorry, I'm just going to stop shaking for a minute. <sighs> right. At 11, I watched my dad die from a heart attack right outside this front door. This was the first real test of my faith, to trust in God's plan even when I didn't understand it or like it. For months, we were surrounded by flowers, food, and prayer. This was an amazing testimony of Christ's love and provision. And he used my mum, Jo, where are you, mum? <laughs> Hiding, as usual. Um, he used my mum as a steadfast example of what it means to trust in and find her daily strength in God. Faithfully raising us alone, to this day, God continues to use mum to spiritually encourage all of us, and we're so grateful for that mum. Barely 18, I left home to study at the University of Otago. Within a week, I had met Steph. Away from the support of my family, church, and Christian friends, I quickly realised how weak and lukewarm my faith really was. I even deceived myself into believing that I could live life in partial obedience to God and still be right with him. I may have been a good person by the world's standards, but I was absolutely living in sin and I was a complete hypocrite to my faith. The reality was, at that time, I chose Steph, sex and partying. God was last on the list. Life was a daily struggle between doing what I wanted and submitting to God's plan for me. Thanks, Michelle. He was testing me and for years I failed. Constantly convicted, I fought sin but with no lasting victory. 
It was a roller coaster of temporarily defeating sin just to fall straight back into it, right? It was only once I genuinely repented, consistently spending time in the word and prayer, and began to trust in God's strength that I was finally able to overcome the sin I had struggled with for years. In 2012, God convicted Steph, and he became a believer. I saw a radical transformation in his life, which was such a contrast to my many, many early years of mediocre, lukewarm faith. This was such an encouragement to me. Pastor Phil married us in 2013 and still continues to teach, encourage, and unfortunately, yes, rebuke us when we need it. Of course, I still fail, and I still still at times struggle with distractions and and selfishness. selfishness. I know God still has a lot of work to do in me and my life. I am so far from perfect, it's not funny. Not meant to laugh at that. But I am thankful to now be led by the Holy Spirit and genuinely desire to be obedient and glorify him through this process. I know my testimony is definitely not as exciting or clear-cut as so many I have heard. But my hope is... If anyone is struggling to live out their faith, as I did, that you would be encouraged and, more importantly, convicted. It is absolutely by God's grace alone that any of us are saved, especially me. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, are written on a pink post-it note on our bathroom mirror to serve as a daily reminder. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Well, obviously, I can't boast, and I'm just so thankful the Lord, by his grace, chose to save me, love me, and bless me. And he is the only reason I am here today. Thanks. Thanks for for coming, everyone. Uh, Firstly... Why am I getting baptised today? It's one of the basics of Christian living that I'm only just committing to, or that we are just committing to. Something that we've put off for years, and I'm not really sure why, but probably, well, definitely pride, immaturity, disobedience. Either way, we're glad to be standing up here with Kate in front of you all as as an act of obedience to God and a shag of my faith. In terms of my walk and a bit of a background, um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Grew up in Hamilton, one of four kids, mum and dad, who are sitting over here. It's good to have you guys here today. It means a lot to us. My first exposure to church was really at Intermediate, where we were forced to go to chapel a couple of times a week. And this was incredibly rules-based and off-putting in terms of what church as I know it today is and should be. Growing up a bit more, I continued to live in the world, parties, plenty of booze, living away at university, living in sin, although I didn't really understand what that meant at that stage. Um, And this, in Dunedin, I met Kate. And this was where I was first introduced to church, faith, and who God is as I know it today. For years, I went along to church with her. But if I was honest, it really was just to please her. I came along, I prayed with her, I even read along with her, but didn't really have any faith that what she believed in was really true. This unevenness and beliefs between us caused many arguments and struggles in our early relationship. But at that point, I didn't really understand why. God was using Kate to show me that my life was heading in the wrong direction. I had everything in front of me, beautiful girlfriend, life, career, but spiritually, it was a pretty short and fiery future. Through this period, I was introduced to Jesus and the story of the gospel. Have I been a lawyer and my personality didn't prove facts before I'd choose to believe anything? I was determined to prove myself, to myself, the existence of God. It was not as simple as just believing for me. I started by looking at the Bible. Could this book be made up? Understanding how the Bible was written, recorded and translated showed me it could not, which left me in a bit of a conundrum. If it wasn't made up and Jesus did exist, then the stories and truths in the rest of the Bible must also be true. 
the main one being that Jesus died for my sin so that I could live forever. If I did not, through God's help, believe and ask for forgiveness of my sins, then I'd be left to pay the price, ultimately dying in hell. Two, however, have the gift of life. I needed to put my faith not in my own doing, my own works, or what was morally right or being a good person, but in the work of God. At this point, I decided I needed to trust in God's word and his promises and to, believe, and to believe that God died on the cross for me. Since that time in my life, I've not lived a perfect life. My previous choices and lifestyle did not magically change. I still struggle with selfishness, pride, serving others, and also clearly obedience and not getting baptised till today. But what has changed is my awareness of my choices, my sin, and my desire to live the God, life that God designed. This, is, this choice has seen me continually, continuously blessed by his grace with what we have in our lives. Our kids, our family, and the friends we have around us. Also our church and the teaching that we're under. But most importantly, the promise we have of our eternal life. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Courtney. Today I am being baptised as an act of obedience to God's word and as a public declaration of my faith in Christ. I am going to share with you my testimony of how I came to know the Lord and the work he has been doing in my life. I grew up in a Christian home, attended church on Sundays and went to a Christian school. I said a prayer when I was seven years old, confessing my sins to God and asking him to be Lord over my life. I believed that God sent his only son to earth to die on the cross for our sins and that by believing this I would receive the gift, the free gift of eternal life and one day go to heaven to live with him forever. Looking back, I'm not entirely sure I was saved when I prayed that prayer or if I was just going through the motions because I felt that that was what was expected of me. I left school after completing year 12 and went on to study business at EIT. It was then that my faith was truly put to the test. I found a new group of friends, but they weren't Christians, so were living a totally different life to the one I had grown up with. Everything that they were doing was new and exciting, and since I had always been one to follow the crowd, I didn't hesitate to join them. Before long, I was skipping my classes at AIT to hang out with these new friends and then lying to my parents about where I was. From there, it was a slippery slope which led to me being in an immoral relationship. I was eventually asked to move out of home because the life that I was living didn't line up with what my parents and ultimately God expected of me. To start with, I loved having the freedom to do whatever I wanted and not have to answer to anyone. I would go out and when I got home, no one would question where I had been or what I had been doing. By this time, I had graduated and had a full-time job, but blew most of my money going out drinking every weekend. I had stopped going to church because I was sleeping off a hangover from the night before. My life was spiralling out of control. I was drinking, smoking, doing drugs, and in immoral relationships. I was doing these things because I thought they made me happy. Throughout this stage of my life, I had a guilty conscience but I eventually became numb to it because I kept ignoring it and continued living in sin. I eventually ended up running out of money and had to move back home. Then in May of 2016, I found out I was pregnant. I considered having an abortion as it seemed like the easy way out. I wouldn't have to tell my parents I was pregnant and it would allow me to continue living in sin. However, the only option was for me to go down to Wellington for the procedure, but this was not possible as I couldn't get time off work, so I continued on with the pregnancy. I believe falling pregnant was God's way of saying enough is enough. It instantly forced me to stop living the life I had been living for the past few years. During this time, I started going back to church occasionally because I felt like something was missing in my life. 
Then, in February of 2017, I gave birth to a beautiful little boy called Jackson. Jackson and I lived at home with my parents, and they helped out wherever they could, but being a single mum was incredibly hard. I was relying on my own strength to try and get me through the long days and sleepless nights. I started to struggle with anxiety and began having panic attacks for the first time in my life. I would worry about what the future held for Jackson, and I wondered what, would, what life would be like for Jackson growing up without a dad. I had also resigned myself to being single for the rest of my life. But thankfully, God had other plans. When Jackson was seven months old, God brought Sam into our lives. The three of us started hanging out and getting to know each other. Sam saw my weaknesses and encouraged me with verses from the Bible, one of them being Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7, which says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I gradually learnt to trust that God has everything in his control. There is nothing that takes him by surprise. He knew my situation and the struggles I was going through. He wanted me to give it all over to him. The more I began to understand this and give my struggles and worries over to God, the more of a weight was lifted off my shoulders. The anxiety I had been having disappeared and the panic attack stopped. I can honestly say I felt the peace of God in my heart that that verse talked about. I began to realize that God had put me through the trials and challenges of being a single mum to make me see my desperate need for him. This was when I knew I was truly saved. Fast forward to 2017 and Sam and I became husband and wife. I am so thankful to God for providing me with a husband who encourages me in my walk with Christ and for blessing Jackson with a loving father, two things I never thought we'd have. It just goes to show that God has a bigger pla- that God had a bigger plan for my life and looking back on it now, I can see that he was using the trials I was facing to bring me back to him. I am so thankful for those trials because I was dead in my sins and was heading for an eternity in hell. But now I am alive in Christ and know that one day I will go to heaven to live with him forever. By God's grace, he opened my eyes to see my desperate need of him and his forgiveness of my sins. I am far from perfect, but I can rejoice knowing that God is faithful to forgive me of my sins, no matter how bad they might seem. I stand here today a changed person not because of anything I have done, but by the power of God and God alone. I just want to finish by reading a couple of verses from one of my favourite songs. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. Good afternoon, good morning. I've um, actually wrestled with doing this today. Some of you who know me know that I was actually baptised 17 years ago and hence my wrestle with the need to get baptised again. Baptism is a requirement for all Christians. In Acts 2 verse 38, Peter preached, Repent and be baptised, every one of you. Baptism follows salvation. In Acts 8 and 16, people received the word of God, believed, and then were baptised. When I was baptised 17 years ago, I was not a Christian, only working my way down the checklist of what a Christian looks like. Religion to me back then was an add-on to life. It was a formal and external thing. Now that I know that I am truly saved, I would often wonder whether I needed to get baptised again, as now I am a Christian. After much thought and discussion with my husband and Pastor Phil, I have decided to do it today. So here's a bit about my journey. In my early years, my family used to attend the Apostolic Church, but when I got around the age of 11, my parents divorced and neither continued to attend church, therefore I no longer went. It was later on in high school that my cousin asked me to go to a sports camp and attend youth group events. 
um, that's when I started going along to Nelson Street Bible Church. I enjoyed the friends I made and the fun things we did at youth group. I sat under teaching and learnt a lot about God and the Bible. I thought I was a Christian. I knew about God and Jesus. I went to church. I tried to read my Bible and go to Bible studies. I was polite. I didn't swear. I didn't get drunk. I was looking around me and I looked like everyone else, so I thought I was a Christian. It was around then that I was baptised. I met Seth and it wasn't long before we were married. I was working as a nurse at the hospital and playing netball most weekends. I enjoyed my netball friends and was more and more drawn to their way of life, partying and living for myself. However, I was still trying to keep up appearances as a Christian and jump through the hoops, but it got harder and harder to do. It was burdensome. I would find myself defending my faith with the argument, how dare you question whether I'm a true believer? I began trying to prove that I was a Christian, and I remember one time Seth getting out of the shower, and I quickly grabbed my Bible and pretended to be reading it because I knew that's what I should be doing. It wasn't long before it became glaringly obvious that I was not a Christian. I did not live for God, and no matter how much I tried to pretend, I did not love God. I loved the world more than my friends and my family. It got to the point where I stopped fighting it. I gave up and I simply accepted that I was not a Christian. In that moment, I felt relief. I was so tired of pretending, so weary from the effort it took to jump through the hoops to look like a Christian. Now I didn't have to go to church. Now I didn't have to read the Bible. I was free from it all and I was relieved. I then boomeranged in the opposite direction and came, became very hostile towards Christianity and God. When Seth would try and talk to me about things of the Lord, I would completely shut off. I didn't want a bar of it. I wanted nothing to do with it. I thought of Christianity as a set of rules, and there was no way I was going back to that struggle. I fully rejected God, and my heart became very hard towards him. My life after that got very selfish, and I got caught up in a downward spiral of sin. I was living life, but I was unhappy. I had got what I wanted, the freedom from all those rules. But I became a slave to my wants and desires, which only left me consumed and unsatisfied. My life was 20% fun and exciting, but the rest of the time I felt really low and empty. I felt stuck and I was miserable. We had the opportunity to travel with Seth's parents to Israel. It was a historical biblical tour of the land. On the first day, we had to stand up in front of the group and say where we were born and where we were born again. The room was full of Aussies, Americans, Germans, Canadians, and all of them born-again believers. I had to stand up in that room and declare I was born in Hastings and I had actually not been born again. A lovely man on the tour that knew the Palmers sat with me one dinner time early into the tour and started to ask questions. I don't remember exactly what he asked me, but I broke down in tears. I didn't even know why I was crying. He spoke to me about God's love for his children, and I remember thinking, how on earth could God love me after everything I've done? I have hated him, rejected him, refused to listen, and yet I got a glimpse of our awesome Heavenly Father with his arms open wide saying, I, I love you, come to me, I want you. I remember being so broken over my sin, and I remember clinging to the hope that God might still possibly love me, and I so desperately wanted that more than anything. Sorry. God changed my heart and opened my spiritual eyes. My heart changed from that point. I completely transformed, overcome with the joy and gratefulness for God's grace, that through Jesus' death on the cross, I could have reconciliation with God. I believed in Christ and wanted to follow him. I had absolute assurance that I was a child of God. And instead of Christianity being about a set of rules, it became a rich and deep relationship with God, fulfilling, joyful. I have peace with God and contentment. It's not a burden, but a joy to live for him and be used for his glory. In the Bible, baptism follows salvation. I have been saved and today I will be baptized. Thank you.
Hey guys, thanks for coming in. If you need to sneak in, come in a bit closer if you want to. So, hey, this is great that we can be here today. I mean, um, this opportunity to witness a baptism is, is something that uh, Jesus instructed his disciples to do. At the very end of his time on earth, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I want you to go and make other disciples who follow Jesus. And then he said to them, I want you to baptize them. And then he said, I want you to teach them all of the things that I've taught you. And so we're here just as an act of obedience to what Jesus says. This baptism doesn't make anybody a Christian. Uh, it doesn't make you a better Christian. It's just an act of obedience to do what Jesus has asked us to do. 
And it's a very, it's a very good illustration of what actually happens when somebody becomes a Christian. Um, we're going to, in a moment, witness four of these people getting dunked under the water. And the Bible says that when we're not Christians, we're like dead to sin and we're like slaves to sin. So we're dead. We are spiritually dead. But when we become a Christian, God makes us alive. He resurrects us. He gives us new life. And so when we dunk people in the water like this, it's a, a real picture of what God has done in our heart, that we were dead to sin. We go under the water. It's like we're dead in our grave and we're raised up to new life the new life in Christ, and we're no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to Christ, and we serve Him and we follow Him. So we're going to get in and do the baptisms, and um, and then at the end of the baptisms, um, Dean Taylor is just going to pray for for the four people who have been baptized. <laughs> and we haven't measured the temperature. <laughs> Oh, it's a bit cold. <laughs> okay, we're all good. Um, well, Steph, thank you for sharing your testimony, mate. It was great to hear what the Lord's doing in your life. And it is just a joy just to be able to, at this time, to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Okay, again, it was great to uh, just hear your testimony and what the Lord's been doing in your life. Uh, and uh, it is a, a joy, again, just to be able to, to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> told us that trials are good and uh, you know what the Lord uses trials in lots of different ways uh, to change us and to open our eyes and uh, Courtney thanks for reminding us of that um, and we're just delighted what the Lord's doing in your life too so thanks so much for your testimony and again it's just a delight to be able to baptize you today in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. say thank you for your testimony as well, just for your openness and your honesty and just uh, some of the challenges that you faced in life, but we're excited that the Lord has uh, transformed your life and changed it, and it's a delight to be able to now to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this day. We thank you that four souls have trusted you and now walked in obedience to uh, go through those waters of baptism, being uh, separated from their sin and separated unto you. And Father, we just pray for them from this day forward. We know you're not finished with them yet. Your grace and your peace would be upon them all the days of their lives, that you would cause them to be a living testimony of your goodness, that, that you would exhibit your character and nature through their lives to others we pray we bless them now we ask you to bless them in jesus name and the whole church said amen, amen.